about a month ago it was a lot hotter than it is now. Her air conditioning wasn't working. So me and Tasha went to her apartment there in Maumee and it, I don't think I was there for the air conditioning. <laughs> I went in and uh, I went out and looked at the air conditioner. Being an electrician, I opened the box, stuck my meter on there, and I'm like, you got no power. <laughs> so I, I went inside the apartment and turned the breaker on. There, air conditioning fixed. But while I was hey, there, uh, I noticed there was no couch, there was no TV, there was no end table, there was uh, it's a, a little more on the story. I, I, I said, well, since I'm here, I'm going to check your furnace filter, make sure, you know, we check the air conditioner. Obviously, these people don't take care of the place, whatever, so I, I checked the furnace filter. But I went to open this closet door, and it was not the furnace door. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was the laundry closet, no washer dryer. And so uh, the Lord pricked my heart immediately. I told Tasha, she was like, we're getting them a washer dryer, whatever Praise we got to do. So, uh, just was consumed by the Holy Spirit right there, just was praying about it. And then I, I remembered while we were driving away from her apartment that she was talking a few weeks earlier about uh, this couch she was looking at, at American Freight. And she was, you know, she had said she had bought a couch. So I got to thinking, what, you know, I wonder what this is. So I drove to American Freight and went in and I talked to the gentleman. I said, is there any way I could find out if a, if a, a Carmen, I won't say her last name, has has ordered a couch or something here, and he said yes. Uh, it's he, he looked it up with her phone number, and she basically had made one one payment, and it was like a thousand fifty dollar couch. So I uh, was a little more. I'm like, we got to get this couch for her. I mean, mm. she has six kids, nothing in this apartment. So um, Tasha and I were brainstorming, and on the way home. She, we decided to uh, send out an email to the guys, all the guys I work with in my electric shop. And uh, over the course of the last three weeks, I collected two thousand and seventy dollars. Praise the from, Lord from all these guys. Praise God. So, furthermore, Jacob Supply over here, uh, he's I worked for his dad, Thad Armatrout. He passed away probably ten years ago, maybe. But I babysat him, and he. He gets discount washers and dryers. So I got an $1,800 washer dryer. It had to be one of those stackable ones. He sold it to me for $800. Praise God. And then I, I called the, Carmen doesn't know any of this when, when it happened. We just gave it to her. It was her birthday Wednesday. So we planned it as a birthday present. So uh, I called the, um, the, the credit company that she had bought the couch through. And I paid the couch off with this cash that I collected from all the men. Hallelujah. And so, yep, so then we, we gave it to her Wednesday. And when I, I brought in this bag, I had a couple gifts Tasha helped me with. But the one, the one bag had two, uh, like a set of washer, washer, dryer, or washer hoses and a dryer, electric dryer cord in the bag. So I gave it to her. I said, these aren't the gifts. They're too big to bring in here. But they're clues. And she pulled out the hoses and she was like looking at them. She's like, what this is. Praise and then the she pulled out the dryer thing and said dryer electric cord on it. She goes, you guys got me a washer dryer? Woo! And she jumped up and down. Amen. She goes, I got a washer dryer. And then, uh, and then, so she opened the next box. Like I said, Tasha helped me with it, but it had pillows, cut like two or three pillows and a, and a blanket. And um, so as she was, she pulled out the first pillow and she was looking all confused. And then she pulled out the second pillow, and she was like, a couch? Amen. You guys got me a couch? She, she was just, she, she couldn't believe it. And I was like, we actually got you the couch you ordered. And she didn't understand that until later in the shop. She was coming to tell me thanks or whatever. And it was just, it was really redeeming. It was pretty cool. Praise God. Yeah. It, it was like, and all the men in the shop, it changed their perspective. You know, people were like, can I come over and help you? And mm -hmm. a guy has now since gone over and put some bunk beds together for her and, you know, taken care of her. And, and so she just, she felt loved. So I thought Amen. it was cool. Praise God. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for reaching out in the love of the Lord and listening to the Holy Spirit. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Word of praise. How's, how, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to thank everybody that knows about my brother's situation that has been praying for him and his family. Um, 
They're doing good. Amen. Um, still going to be a long road. But I just thank you. you know, prayer, prayer is what I needed that night for him as well. And I just thank you for the long Praise God. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Praise God. Dad's doing good. He's cancer free. He had a surgery. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Anyone else? Yes. Praise God. That God has supernaturally Praise God. Because he has no pain and he can see better than himself. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for sharing, Kathy. I, I, I missed it last week, uh, and, I, and I hope I don't mess this up this week. Um, but I, I just want to introduce uh, for the first time, uh, as far as I know, I know they were pronounced husband and wife, but I'd like to, to just let everyone know that uh, it is good to have Brad and Ellie McMunn here today. Welcome uh, these, these fresh new uh, married young couple. God bless you. I apologize. If I, I just missed it last week, and, and I just wanted to recognize you. Is uh, going well? Awesome. Anyone else have a word of praise? Turn with me, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 18. We're going to look at vessels very briefly today. We began last week journeying to maturity. We talked about uh, the, a, a few things we can count on. We can count on his presence on this journey. We are not alone. We can count on that uh, he has a purpose. And he is waiting for us to, to embrace that purpose. And his purpose for his children is not comfort. We'll look at that today. And that our, our God is faithful to that purpose. Vessels, as we, as, as, as we come to deeper understand the reality and the truth of what it means to be a vessel, we, we, we need to understand that a vessel, a vessel will receive and a vessel contains. But then that vessel then in turn shares. What God is doing in each of our lives individually and, 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 and corporately as a church, we don't just hold on to it and, 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 and hoard it here. We, we must share. It must go out. We contain it for a little bit. We receive it. We contain it. But then we must share it. The nation of Israel has sort of reached sort of, uh, you know, um, what's going on here. And, 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 and God is ready to pass some judgment and this and that. But, and, and he's talking about the nations. But I think it relates very much so to where we find ourselves on our journey to spiritual maturity individually and corporately. Jeremiah chapter 18. I came across this this, this this week as I was reading Oswald Chambers. The first thing that happens, Oswald Chambers writes, the first thing that happens after we recognize our election by God in Christ Jesus, our, our choosing, we have been chosen by God. We have been voted yes by God. After we recognize and, and realize our re election by God in Christ, 
something begins to happen. They say it's called a, uh, uh, our preconceived ideas begin to be destroyed. What we thought about God turns out to be much, much different. What we, what we begin to understand about God and Jesus Christ, it starts to change. Our, our, our narrow-minded thinking is, is all of a sudden re, revamped and, 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 and re-looked at. And, and all of our other allegiances, those are going to be gone. We, we are turned solely into servants of God for His own purpose. What's God's purpose for us? The Westminster Shorter Catechism says this is the purpose of God for his creation. The entire human race was created to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But you see, sin has diverted the human race onto another course. But it has not And sin has been defeated on the cross of Calvary. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ won that one. And he rose again and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he is coming again. I don't know when, but he is coming again. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe we are in those last days. Though sin has diverted the human race onto another course, it has not altered God's purpose to the slightest degree. And when we are born again, we are brought into the realization of God's great purpose for the human race, namely that he created us for himself. And when we realize our election by God, we realize that that election is the most joyful thing on earth. And we must learn to rely on the tremendous creative purpose and power of God. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Verse 18, chapter 18, beginning with verse 1. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. Verse 3. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hand, so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, Can I not do with you as this potter does? Declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. In this journey, on this adventure, moving towards maturity, There are going to be times that he's going to put us back on the wheel. He's going to make some adjustments. We are going to go back on the wheel now and again. I have never been good at pottery casting. I am not good at spinning that wheel and, 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 and grabbing a hold of a piece of clay. Is there someone here that can do that? I cannot do it. It's an art. But in the reality and the truth of what we read here, we can see a couple things. First, first, before we jump too far, God is always talking to us. God is always about having conversation. God is about being in relationship with his creation. But, 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 but the, 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 the thing is, are we listening? You see, God is patiently gracious with us. Even though we are undeservables, We don't deserve it. 
But he hands it and says, here it is. He extends grace to us and he says, here I am. I love you. Let me do this work. For he's the only one that can do it. Let me do this work. In this passage of scripture, right up front, we see very quickly, very uh, uh, clear and plain this, that God is sovereign. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as he seemed best. Then the word of the Lord came to me, verse 6, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter does? Do I need your permission to do with you as the potter does? Well, certainly we surrender. But God's going to do his work because he's faithful to his purpose. And God is sovereign. What does the sovereignty of God look like? What does sovereign mean? He is the highest. He is the most magnificent. He is the supreme. Why not allow him to do the work that only he can do? He knows best what we need anyway. Amen? He created these hearts of us. He is completely sovereign. Jerry Bridges puts it like this. God is completely sovereign and infinite in wisdom. He is perfect in love. And in his love, he always wills what is best for us. And in his wisdom, he always knows what is best. And in his sovereignty, he has the power to bring that about. Can I be holy? Yes, you can, but only by the work of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who does the work. He is sovereign. David put it like this in Psalm chapter 86, verse 10. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. You alone. I am yours. Here's my heart, Lord. Because he is sovereign. It was written many years ago. But it goes like this. Morning sun, light of creation, grassy fields, a velvet floor, silver clouds, a shimmering curtain. He's designed a perfect world. I'm amazed at his talents. Stand in awe of one so great. Now my soul begins to sing out to the source from which it came. Bless the Lord who reigns in beauty. Bless the Lord who reigns with wisdom and with power. Bless the Lord who fills my life with so much love. He can make a perfect heart. I believe the songwriter was Dottie Rambo. And that's way before my time. God in his sovereignty can make a perfect heart. We believe that as Wesley and the holiness people John Wesley very rarely used the word entire sanctification. But what he did use was Christian perfection. A work of the heart that only this sovereign God can do. No other. We can't do it. Our responsibility, here I am, Lord. Do that work in me. 
that you so desire to do. And we submit and we surrender and we consecrate our lives to the sovereignty of God. For you see, this journey to, 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 to spiritual maturity, this journey to maturity is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. In Jeremiah chapter 17, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And he, in verse 9, we read these words. And, and this is why the heart is so important. We've got to let the sovereign creator, the one who, who breathed, breathed breath into us, do that work which only he can do. Because the Lord himself says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Man, it's like we're defeated right off the bat. I disagree with that. We've got a sovereign God who loves us. We've got a God who cares about us. We've got a God who will do that work as we allow him to do it. For you see, it's a matter of the heart. The Lord says to Ezekiel in chapter 11, verse 19, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh, a heart that, 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 that I can mold, a heart that, that I can shape, a heart that they'll allow me to rework, a heart that they'll allow me to transform, to, to remold. And isn't that what the potter was doing here, whether it be a parable or not? It's about God in his sovereignty saying, I can do this. Will you allow me to do it? It's a matter of the heart. Paul writes about it in Romans chapter 2 as, as he's talking, you know, with the, 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 the covenant of circumcision and, and the sign and this and that. And we all know what the, Abra, you know, the Abrahamic covenant was and you shall, you know, um, um, the, 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 the circumcision and everything. But Paul puts it this way. A person is not a Jew, Romans chapter 2, beginning with verse 28, is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. Then he says this, a person is a Jew who is one, who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the written code, such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. We see a sovereign God on this journey, and he is big, and he is, he is mighty, and he is, he is holy, and he is magnificent, and he is supreme, and he is, he is the, the lone author and, 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 and finisher of the work that needs to happen within each of us. He begins it, he finishes it. It's a matter of the heart. And matters of the heart always include pain. But I don't want to go back on the potter's wheel. And oh, by the way, don't throw me as hard as you did the last time. This journey is a matter of the heart. And it's going to include pain. Jesus said in John chapter 15, beginning with verse 1, going through verse 2, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Leave it alone, pastor. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Pam's father loved to grow apple trees in his backyard, and we had purchased him a couple of peach trees, and he loved to have raspberry bushes for all his children, and he always put in a big garden. But he was always, 
There was only a certain time in the year that he would allow one to prune those apple trees and those trees. And it always came in the middle of January when it's cold and the snow's blowing, but that's when they're dormant and you don't start it early and you don't do it late. As he age uh, wouldn't allow him to do that anymore, being close. Gary, what are you doing today? Well, I'm going to stay in and near the fire and try to stay warm. Well, you know what time it is, don't you? I said, I actually do. It's about 10 in the morning. I got the saw ready. I think he can be here shortly after lunch. And that, that day it was cold. I mean cold. And I could see him watching me from the garage door and he said I want them to have a good haircut for the winter so I've, I gave them a pruning like I had never given those trees from day one and I'm thinking he'll never ask me to do this again ever I finished up gathered up all those branches and burnt them right there. Took the things into the garage and he hands me I said everything's done and he hands me a small container of tar. Now you need to go out there and you need to cover every cut. I called Pam on my cell phone. I said, this is the last time I'm doing this. You're not going to believe what I got to, I've got to do now. But I did it. And I will say this. As spring came and those trees started to blossom and those spots where I had pruned began to show signs of life again, <laughs> those apple trees produced that year like I'll never ever see again. It's amazing. And it's no difference in our journey with the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's branches that, that are not producing fruit, the gardener is going to trim them off. And surgery hurts. There's pain with it. And then those branches that produce fruit, he is going to prune so they will do what? Produce more fruit. Because God is sovereign. He knows what it takes to produce within each individual. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that bears fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Fruitful. Paul put it like this in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, and we are justified through faith, we are saved by grace through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Again, not a hope that we do, but a hope that we possess. God himself, Jesus Christ, third person of the Trinity. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Now I'm not saying we stand before God and say, here's a branch that's not producing. Please cut it off as quickly as possible. That may happen. And if the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us that way and conviction says we need to be done with that, then by all means we say, take it. It 
is yours. But know this, if he cuts it, he's going to put a salve on it that will bring so much joy and gladness and righteousness. And it will just heal in an amazing way because that's what our sovereign God is about. Not only so, but we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love, excuse me, has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for he is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. And as that good shepherd takes care of his sheep, it is the same way with us in this day. He anoints our heads with oil. And that is an oil of joy. That is an oil of healing. That is an oil of gladness. Can we measure growth? Can we measure spiritual growth? I believe there is. Measurements. I'd like to share with you today 10 signs or 10 markers, 10 evidences of a maturing Christian. Remember, God is sovereign. It's a matter of the heart. The journey is going to include, not maybe, not possibly, some pain. The first thing that that I've came across over the last few years and as I've journeyed with the Lord Jesus Christ and he continues to do that work which only he can do within myself personally. One of those signs is this. There's a growing hunger for the word of God. There's a growing hunger for the word of God on this journey to maturity. John Wesley put it like this. I want to know one thing. I want to know the way to heaven. God himself came down to earth to teach the way. He wrote it down in a book. And John Wesley would scream, would at the top of his lungs, give me that book at any price. Give me the book with the name Jesus Christ in. We have a growing hunger for the word of God. Another marker is this. We begin to have an increasing desire to know the truth of God's word. Just surface study will not do it anymore. We're going to want to get down in. We are going to want to chew on it. We are going to want to spit out what we don't need and just chew on what God has for us. We begin to have a growing hunger for God's word. There is an increasing Desire to know the truth of God's word. We begin to have a greater sensitivity towards sin. Well, it's no big deal. Sin is a big deal. Sin will take, sin will take you any, take you farther than you ever wanted to go. It will keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And sin will kill you. Sin will destroy the work of sin will destroy the work of God in a person's heart if we're not dealing with it. A greater sensitivity towards sin. We begin to have a decreasing desire for the world's system. It's not about us. 
The world says, what about you? What about you? What about you? But we, as we grow into spiritual maturity, we begin, uh, there begins to be, come within us a decreasing desire for the world system. Your sphere of love is continually increasing. It's easier, we begin to see and understand that it's easier to forgive those who offend us. Pastor, you're going to meddle so much. We begin to have an increasing desire to obey God. We have an ever-increasing faith. We have an increasing concern for the spiritual condition of other people. Matt, thank you so much for sharing. Matt and Tasha, thank you for your hearts and listening to the Holy Spirit. We don't know, and you don't know, how God could, what he's going to do out of you guys listening to that. Now, I am going to say everyone that possibly was involved in that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Your people at work are probably quite a great uh, array of guys and, 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 and gals. But this has made an impact on them. And I know enough that I, the, 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 the length I've been here that it's not about Matt, it's not about Tasha. It's about doing what's right for others. Spear of love, it's getting increasing. An ever-increasing faith. An increasing concern for the spiritual condition of other people. And our feelings of love for God are increasing. Is God sweeter today than he was yesterday in your life? Is God's goodness changed in your life from when you began walking with him? Oh, it's the same, but we see it differently. We're involved in it differently. Why do I say this is a matter of the heart? Because Jesus himself said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God is sovereign. It is a matter of the heart. Pain on the journey. But we already know that. For you see, the ancient words tell us that. Blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. It's an old worship song from a few years back. If you know it, sing along with it as it's on the screen. Doesn't this sovereign God have the right to mold and shape us? He created us. Once this song finishes, I've asked Earl if he'll come and close in prayer. But think about this, a growing hunger for God's word, increasing desire to know the truth of his word, greater sensitivity towards sin, a, desire, a decreasing desire for the world system. Our sphere of love is continually increasing. It's easier to forgive those who offend us and increasing desire to obey God and ever increasing faith and increasing concern for the spiritual condition of others and our feelings of love for God are ever 